Good morning, everybody, and welcome to another webinar brought to you by the National Institute for Occupational Health. Um, this particular webinar is dealing with uh, a question that has come up from amongst the attendees and stakeholders of the NIH, um, dealing with the basic ventilation requirements, the COVID-19 directions, and the national building regulations and other related uh, guidelines and frameworks. So we have three um, guest speakers for you today, and I'll be introducing them in a moment. I just want to double check on my colleague. Um, I do know that she might have another engagement today. Um, Dr. Singh, Dr. Tanusha Singh, are you um, online? I think I see you. I'm going to immediately hand over to Dr. Tanusha Singh. She is the chairperson of the NIH's COVID-19 Occupational Health Outbreak Response Team, that's the OHORT team, as well as the head of the NIH's Immunology and Microbiology section. I thank you very much for joining us this morning. I know your schedule is very busy. Dr. Singh, I hand over to you. Thank you so much, Ashraf. Uh, greetings, everyone. On behalf of the NIOH, um, a division of the NHLS, uh, a very warm welcome to you all on this chilly day uh, to yet another NIOH COVID uh, webinar. It's um, really wonderful to have so many of you joining us this morning. I think the count is 424 participants. I'd like to welcome our expert presenters today, Ms. Jabu Mshlopi from the Department of Employment and Labor, Mr. Tobias van Brienen from the CSRR, and Mr. Moses McCorney from the NIOH, who will unpack this topic that uh, we are presenting today. Welcome colleagues, and thank you so much for availing yourselves yet again and sharing your knowledge with us. It's really appreciated. I think the timing of this webinar is very appropriate as we tend to close our windows and doors to keep warm, and in so doing alter the ventilation in confined and occupied spaces, which could impact on airborne transmission of certain biological agents. And whilst the focus of today's webinar will be on COVID-19 and basic ventilation requirements, which is one aspect of your basket of controls, we should be thinking more holistically of other agents and risks as well when implementing mitigation strategies, which I'm sure the presenters will highlight today. To all the participants today, thank you for taking the time to be here and thank you for the, uh, your topic suggestions from time to time, which informs these webinars do keep them coming. I also want to take the opportunity to thank our colleagues working behind the scenes uh, to bring these sessions to you. Thank you very much for all your efforts, colleagues. We trust that you will have a, a very informative session today and that it will assist in your decision-making in your respective workplaces. May you have a productive session today and do take care. Over to you, Ashraf. Thank you very much. That was Dr. Tanusha Singh, the chairperson of the NIH's COVID-19 OHORT team, as well as the head of our immunology and microbiology section here at the NIH. Thank you very much for uh, joining us today, Dr. Singh. And then, yes, as uh, Dr. Singh indicated, we have um, three very good speakers. Our first speaker today is Ms. Jabulele Mshlope. Uh, she is dealing, she's from the Department of Employment and Labor, and I'll give a little bit of an introduction to her in a moment. Um, she's dealing with the topic of COVID-19 directions and basic ventilation requirements, keeping in mind that there are specific um, directions, uh, official directions, um, basic uh, requirements and guidelines that have been produced by the Department of Employment and Labor under the National Disaster Act. Um, so that will be covered by Ms. Klope. Um, so the second topic is ventilation guidance for COVID-19. And Mr. Dubais van Rienen from the Council for Scientific and Industrial Research, the CSIR, would be dealing with that. Um, he is uh, in the Eastern Cape, so we are just assisting him to uh, get into the webinar uh, from where he is. Um, and our colleagues in the IT section, uh, Tabani and Glenn, is providing the support for that. And our third speaker is Mr. Moses McCorney, my colleague here in the building. Uh, he is from our occupational hygiene section here at the NIH, 
and he will be dealing with ventilation during COVID-19 pandemic. And he's, he's coming from an occupational hygiene um, angle and perspective to the particular topic. So what is critical for me, um, just from a bit of a virtual webinar house rules, um, please, as a reminder, um, let me start with the raising of hands. Um, there are two of our attendees who have raised their hands, and that's patients and Karabo. Um, the raised hand function is not possible with such a large number, and that's Mzwandili as well as now added a name, a hand, raised hand. Oh, more people. So please, my request to you is to please lower your hand. If there's anything specific you would like to raise, please type your comment in the general chat box. We are unable to open your microphones with almost 500 people in the webinar. It's not going to be possible. So a reminder, please do not use the raise hand function. Please type your comment or question in the chat box and we will respond to you uh, where you type it there. Secondly, um, if you have questions for the presenters and the content of the presentations, we will please ask you to type your questions where the facility is available for us to answer you as presenters and panelists. So in addition to our three presenters, there are a number of panelists and these panelists will also support in answering questions um, before that you type in the question and answer box. So you'll see at the bottom of your screen, there are two uh, people at the bottom there. I hope I'm pointing in the right place. That's the question answer box. The, 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 oh, the single bubble that says chat, that's where you type your general comments. And um, I hope that you have very good connection to your internet. If you do have audio issues, please just check your settings there in your um, Zoom app and the audio settings of your uh, laptop computer. And for those who are using cell phones, please sometimes you are registered in the name of your cell phone and that's problematic in that when the Zoom record uh, provides us with a list of people who need to get a certificate of attendance, then your name and surname is not there. You do have the opportunity to, I think, during the session to rename yourself, just double check the function there um, and put your name and surname there. Otherwise, if you are not having your name and surname, maybe just a quick type in the chat box if there's an issue with regard to how you are registered. Okay, so um, uh, just a quick uh, check here, and I'm going to hear from Jambuliel um, Mshlope, uh, Mshlope from the Department of Permanent Labor. I see that she is on our panelist presenter list. Um, if she could just quickly check um, her PowerPoint presentation sharing, as well as her audio. And then we can uh, promptly proceed to that. While we're doing that, uh, um, there is a general certificate of attendance, as I've mentioned, and that's based on your uh, record on the Zoom of having been registered and logged in to the session. And we will be within 24 to 40, uh, 48 hours be sending out that general certificate of attendance. For those who belong to professional bodies that are accredited for the COVID-19 webinars that the NIH uh, um, deliver, we um, provide you within 24 to 48 hours after the webinar with a via email with the link and the password to register on our online CPD test. And uh, on the successful completion of that test, you will receive your CPD attendance certificate to submit to your professional body. We do not lie between members of the professional bodies uh, on your behalf with your professional bodies. You will have to lie with them directly. And then also we send you a, the a email after the webinar with all the links to presentations, as well as the audio and video recording. Those links, uh, those uh, uh, recordings, as well as presentations, PowerPoint slide packs are uploaded onto our website, etc. And those links are sent to you. Our website is zero rated by all of the um, cell phone service providers, as well as an internet service provider. So you won't be charged any data to visit our website. That's www.nih.ac.za, www.nioh.ac.za no data will be charged when you go and look for the presentations and the many other webinars that's already there and other resources. We also send you a link to ask you to provide feedback on the webinar as Dr. Singh has indicated. 
to say, you, you know, give us a very honest feedback, as well as there's a section where you can give us some general comments on topics that you'd want to see the webinars cover. And I think, of, um, as I've mentioned earlier, the link for the CPD test is also circulated. Well, having done all of the admin and completed all of that, um, I now need to just um, quickly um, find, I think I found it, uh, Ms. Jabulile, there we go. I've, so I'm going to ask um, our first presenter, Ms. Jabulile Mshlope, from the Department of Employment and Labor, who's going to deal with the topic COVID-19 directions and basic ventilation requirements to uh, just uh, open a microphone and share her slides. Um, that will be much appreciated. Okay, a quick reminder, I just saw somebody raise their hands. The raised hand function is not um, active for this webinar. Uh, Jabo, I see your, your microphone is open. Ah, you, thank you very much. I see you sharing your screen. If you could maximize your um, slide, please. I'm trying. <laughs> Yeah, no, sometimes technology is as cold as my knees today. Um, and I'm sure you can see that I'm a bit overdressed. <laughs> there you go. Perfect. Thank you very much. Yes. And thank you again for taking the time to join us today. Um, I do know that you and your colleagues are being called upon across the country to support in the process of the Department of Employment Labor's work. So by a brief introduction, Ms. Jabulili Mshlopi is a specialist in occupational health and hygiene responsible at the Department of Employment and Labor, responsible for regulations for hazardous biological agents and diving, qualified as environmental health officer, having a BTEC in environmental health, presently studying her master's in public health at Wits University. And in May 1989, she started a career uh, practicing as an environmental health officer with the Department of Health. And in July 2017, moved to the Department of Employment and Labor to join the Occupational Health and Hygiene Directorate. Uh, within Occupational Health and Hygiene Directorate, she promotes uh, preventative health, ensuring that employees work in healthy environments that will protect them from contracting occupational diseases and she is res presently responsible for monitoring the implementation of the HBA, the Hazardous Biological Agents Regulations, in the affected sectors and to ensure that employees are protected from the exposure to HBAs and that employers put in place all required protective and preventative measures. Uh, she's also the chairperson of the technical committee for the Hazardous Biological Agents Regulations. And a birdie has told me, um, Jabu, that there may be a, uh, a, a, I think, an update and a renewal of that regulations as well. Uh, with that short uh, introduction uh, to our guest, Ms. Chabulele Mshlope, um, I hand over to you. Please proceed. Thank you, Ashraf. Uh, good morning, colleagues, um, in this very cold morning, but I hope my presentation won't be as cold as it is this morning. I will be giving a brief uh, presentation on the consolidated directions on occupational health and safety measures in certain workplaces. The content of my presentation is there will be an introduction, the application, risk assessment and plans for protective measures, administrative measures, social distancing measures, symptom screening, sanitizers, disinfectants and washing of hands, cloth masks, measures in workplaces with public access, ventilation, specific personal protective equipment, monitoring and enforcing directions. Uh, the, as we are all aware that the president declared a national state of disaster in terms of the Disaster Management Act 2002 on 15 March 2020 to address COVID-19 outbreak. It's amazing that we are over a year since the national disaster uh, was declared and COVID is here with us. The declaration enables government to have integrated and coordinated disaster management mechanisms 
focusing on the prevention and reduction of the outbreak of COVID-19. These directions were issued in terms of Regulation 410 of the Disaster Management Act 2002 as amended. The main purpose for this direction was to give measures to address, prevent and combat the spread of COVID-19 in certain workplaces in the Republic of South Africa. These directions we apply for the duration of the national state of disaster, unless otherwise indicated. And these directions, they apply to employers and workers in workplaces who are permitted to continue or commence operations under the disaster management regulations but they do not apply to workplaces that are excluded from the Occupational Health and Safety Act in terms of Section 1.3 of the OHS Act. Also, they don't apply in place workplaces in respect of which another minister has issued a direction under the regulations dealing with health and safety of employees in those workplaces. Now we come to the protective measures that employers need to put in place under the risk assessment. The employer must undertake a risk assessment to give effect to the minimum measures required by these directions, taking into account the specific circumstances of the workplace and the requirements of the hazardous biological agents, meaning that even if the employer had a risk assessment in place, but that risk assessment had to be reviewed so that the measures that are contained in the directions that might affect that risk assessment might be included in that risk assessment. And on the basis of that risk assessment, the employer must develop a plan outlining the protective measures in place for the phase in return of its employees before the opening of the workplace. Remember, most of the workplaces were had to close down during the level five. So when they were going to be opening, they had to put this plan in place. And during that time, they, had, they needed to consult with the representative trade union, the health and safety committee or health and safety representative with regards to the risk assessment and the plan that the employer has put in place. And that plan is to be made available for inspection by an inspector from the Department of Employment and Labor, representative of trade union, health and safety committee or health and safety representative. What must be included in that plan? The plan had to have the date of the opening of the workplace and the hours of opening. And they contain the list of employees who were permitted to return to work and those who are required to work from home. And also contain the timetable for the phase in return of employees to their workplace. As most of the workplaces employees uh, were phased in, they did not all return at the same time. Also identify the vulnerable employees and also containing the ways of minimizing the number of workers at the workplace at any one given time. The measures in place for the daily screening of employees and the screening of clients, contractors and visitors to the workplace. And also the details of the COVID-19 compliance officer who has been appointed by the employer. Then when it comes to administrative measures, the employer is required to establish the following administrative measures. If 
there are more than 50 employees, the employer must submit the records of his risk assessment together with a written policy concerning the protection of the health and safety of his employees from COVID-19. To this, this uh, the policy must be also be accessible by the health and safety committee and the Department of Employment and Labor within 21 days of the commencement of the direction. Requiring employees to disclose whether they have any of the health issues or comorbidities and thereafter take special measures to mitigate the risk of COVID-19 for those employees. One of the measures would be for those employees to work from home. Notify all workers of the contents of these directions. Notify its employees not to come to work and must take paid sick leave if they are sick or have symptoms associated with COVID-19. Also, the employer had to appoint a manager as a COVID-19 compliance officer to oversee the implementation of the plan. Remember, at first we said there must be a risk assessment and a plan in place. So the compliance officer has to oversee the implementation of that plan, oversee the adherence to the health and safety measures established in terms of the direction. Also address employee or workplace representative concerns and to keep them informed on the nature of the hazard in that workplace and control measures to be taken. And ensure that if you can see that the, the, the compliance officer needed to be someone who understands the risk and hazards at the workplace and who will be able to give guidance to other employees on how to take preventative measures. And then the employer had to ensure that the measures required by this direction and its risk assessment plan are strictly complied with through monitoring and supervision. Must as far as practicable minimize the number of workers at the workplace at any given time through rotation or staggered working hours, shift system, remote working arrangements, or similar measures in order to achieve social distancing so as to limit congestion in public transport and at the workplace. Remember, if you the, 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 the employees come at the staggered working hours, at least there won't be, there would be limit. The, the, the congestion in public transport, as we know that in the morning, everybody is rushing, but if the employees come maybe at a later stage, then there would not be any congestion in public transport. Then take measures to minimize contact between workers, as well as between workers and members of the public. And if there's a worker who's been diagnosed with COVID-19, the employer must inform the National Institute for Occupational Health in accordance with the National Department of Health guidelines. Also inform the Compensation Commissioner in accordance with the Directive on Compensation for Workplace Acquired Novel Coronavirus Disease. As you might be aware that COVID-19 is a reportable occupational disease investigate the mode of exposure, any control failure, and review its risk assessment to ensure that the necessary controls and PPE requirements are in place. And determine the need to temporarily close the affected work area for decon decontamination with due regard to the Department of Health guidelines after consultation with the health and safety committee or with the health and safety representative. I think I need to emphasize here that it says, the direction says temporarily close the affected work area. 
There were instances whereby you find that maybe the employee is working on the, maybe the ground floor, but the whole building will be closed for decontamination, even if the employee has never been to the other floors. Give administrative support to any contact tracing measures implemented by the Department of Health. In addition to the duties listed in subdirection one, an employer who employs more than 50 employees in a workplace must submit the following categories of data to the National Institute for Occupational Health. Number one, each employee's vulnerability status for serious outcomes of a COVID-19 infection. And this is a once of a submission. Number two, details of the COVID-19 screening of employees who are symptomatic. And then details of employees who test positive in terms of a positive laboratory test for the COVID-19 virus. So this information is sent to NIOH. Also, the number of employees identified as high risk contacts within the workplace if a worker has been confirmed positive. And also the details on the post infection outcomes of those testing positive, including the return to work assessment outcome. And the above information, that is number two to five, must be provided every Tuesday for the previous week. I hope this is clear. Under social distancing measures, every employer must ensure that there is a minimum of one and a half meters between workers while they are working. If this is not practicable, the employer needs to arrange workstations to be spaced at least one and a half meters apart and then the employer must arrange physical barriers to be placed between work stations. If it's not possible maybe to arrange the workstations to be spaced at least one and a half meters, then there must be physical barriers between those workstations and also supply the employees free of charge with appropriate PPE based on their risk assessment. Every employer must ensure that social distancing measures are implemented through supervision. Within the workplace, it must be through the staggering of the break times and outside the immediate workplace, you know, like at our labor centers, we do have uh, clients coming through to our labor centers and they are queues. So the employer must ensure that they control also those queues to maintain the social distancing. Every employer must take measures to screen workers when they report for work in order to ascertain whether they have any of the symptoms associated with COVID-19. Require workers to immediately inform the employer if they experience any of the symptoms in subdirection one while at work. So if a worker presents with COVID-19 related symptoms or advises the employer of these symptoms, the employer must not permit the worker to enter the workplace or report for work. So let's say they screen me at the entrance and they find that maybe I might be COVID-19, I might have symptoms for COVID-19, then I won't be applied. I won't be allowed to enter the workplace. If the worker is already at work, immediately isolate the worker, provide the worker with a surgical mask and arrange for the worker to be transported to a health facility.
Then assess the risk of transmission, disinfect the area and the worker's workstation, undertake contact tracing and refer those workers who may be at risk for screening and take any other appropriate measure to prevent possible transmission. And then place its employee on paid sick leave in terms of section 22 of the Basic Conditions of Employment Act, or if the employee's sick leave is exhausted, make application for an illness benefit on the COVID-19 Temporary Employer Relief Scheme. Take steps to ensure that the employee is not discriminated against on grounds of having tested positive for COVID-19. As you might be aware that in most cases, when employees test positive at workplace, there were some form of discrimination against those employees, especially when they return to work, some people wouldn't be comfortable to be in the same room with them. And then if there's evidence that the worker contracted COVID-19 arising out and in the course of employment, lodge a claim for compensation in terms of COIDA Act. As I've said, COVID-19 is an, a, a compensable disease. And then if a worker has been diagnosed with COVID-19 and isolated in accordance with the Department of Health guideline, an employer may only allow a, a worker to return to work under the following, without requiring viral testing, if the worker has completed the mandatory 10 days of isolation, either from the onset of symptoms. And then in mild cases of infection, not requiring hospitalization for COVID-19, or in moderate to severe cases of infection, that is requiring supplemental oxygen or hospitalization from the date of achieving clinical stability or earlier if the worker has gone for a medical evaluation confirming fitness to work. If the employer ensures that personal hygiene, wearing of mask, social distancing and cough etiquette is strictly adhered to by the worker. If the employer closely monitors the worker for symptoms and on return to work, and if the worker on return to work wears a surgical mask for 21 days from the date of diagnosis. So those are the conditions for the return of the worker who had tested positive. If a worker has been in contact in the workplace with another worker who has been diagnosed with COVID-19, the employer must assess that worker's exposure in order to ascertain whether the exposure carries a high or low risk of transmission between the workers. Therefore, if there is a low risk of exposure, the employer may permit the worker to continue working using a cloth mask complying with the standard precautions and must monitor the worker's symptoms for, for 10 days from the start of the first contact. And then if there is a high risk of exposure, a health worker must remain in quarantine for seven days or with the agreement of the worker, it can be five days. And then all other workers, remember number A, we are talking to a, of a health worker. Number two is all other workers must remain in quarantine for 10 days. And the employer of that worker must place the worker on sick leave in accordance with subdirection 3B3 for that period. If the worker remains asymptomatic, no further testing is required prior to return to work. 
except in respect of health workers returning to work in less than 10 days. When it comes to the issue of uh, sanitizers, disinfectants and washing of hands, for the purpose of this direction, a hand sanitizer must be one that has at least 70% alcohol content and a surface disinfectant must be in accordance with the recommendations of the Department of Health. And every employer must, free of charge, ensure that there are sufficient quantities of hand sanitizers to be used at the entrance based on the number of workers or other persons who access the workplace. And every employee who works away from the workplace, other than at home, let's say you are a field worker like us that you need to go out, must be provided with an adequate supply of hand sanitizers. And also if a worker interacts with the public, the employer must provide the worker with sufficient supply of hand sanitizer for both the worker and the person he is interacting with. For example, at the entrance with the maybe sec the security personnel, there must be enough hand sanitizers for both the workers and the, pe the people they are interacting with. Every employer must make, sh take, make sure that all work surfaces and equipment are disinfected before work begins, during the working period, and after work ends. So what has been happening, because sometimes it's, it's really difficult to, for, the, for the cleaners to do this, uh, our employer has provided each and every official with a disinfectant and a cloth, so we are able to disinfect our own uh, workspaces. All areas such as laboratories, common areas, door handles, shed, electronic equipment are regularly cleaned and disinfected and disable biometric system or make them COVID-19 proof. Also the employer must ensure that there are adequate facilities for the washing of hands with soap and clean water and only paper towels are provided to dry hands the use of fabric toweling is prohibited. Then the workers are required to wash their hands and sanitize their hands regularly while at work. The workers who are interacting with the public are instructed to sanitize their hands between each interaction with a member of the public and surfaces that workers and members of the public come into contact with are routinely cleaned and disinfected. Then when it comes to the issue of cloth masks, the Department of Health requires that all persons wear cloth masks when in public place to reduce the amount of virus containing droplets being transmitted to others and to surfaces that others may touch. The underlying Underlying the requirement from the Department of Health, every employer must provide each of its employees free of charge with a minimum of two cloth masks, which comply with the recommended guidelines for fabric face masks 22 for the employee to wear while at work and while commuting to and from work. And the number and replaceability of cloth masks that must be provided to an employee must be determined in accordance with any sectoral guideline and in the light of the employee's condition of work, in particular, where these may result in becoming wet or soiled. Then every employer must ensure that workers are informed, trained, instructed, and supervised as to the correct use of cloth masks. The general requirement for workers to wear masks does not derogate from the fact that where a risk assessment indicates that specific personal protective equipment is required, 
those categories of workers must be provided with the effective and efficient personal protective equipment. For example, if your work requires you to wear the N95 mask, then the employer must provide you with that one and not replace it with a cloth mask. Workplaces with public access. As far as is reasonably practicable, given the nature of the workplace, every employer must determine the floor area of the workplace in square meters in order to determine the number of customers and workers that may be inside the workplace at any one given time with adequate space available. Arrange the workplace to ensure that there is a distance of at least one and a half meters between the workers and members of the public or between members of the public. Put in place physical barriers at counters or provide workers with face shields or visors. Undertake symptom screening measures of persons other than its employees entering the workplace. Display notices advising persons other than employees entering the workplace of precautions to be observed while in the workplace. Require members of the public, including suppliers, to wear masks when inside the premises. Take steps to ensure that customers queuing inside or outside the workplace are able to maintain a distance of one and a half meters from each other. Provide hand sanitizer for use by the public at the entrance to the workplace and assign an employee as a compliance officer to ensure that these measures are complied with. And then under ventilation, I know there are experts who will um, dwell much on the issue of ventilation. This is just a brief uh, outline of what is contained in the direction. So it's every employer must keep the workplace well ventilated by natural or mechanical means to reduce the SARS-CoV-2 viral load. Where reasonably practicable, have an effective local extraction ventilation system with high efficiency particulate air filters that are technically assessed to be functioning effectively, is regularly cleaned and maintained, does not recirculate the air, ensure that the ventilation vents do not feed back in through open windows, and ensure that ventilation filters are cleaned and replaced in accordance with the manufacturer's instructions by a competent person. Under monitoring enforcement, <clears throat> to an extent that this direction gives effect to the Occupational Health and Safety Act, the minister responsible for employment and labor may authorize local authorities to perform certain inspectorate functions in terms of section 42.3 of the OHS Act. And if a person fails to comply with this direction, an inspector may perform any of the functions in section 29 of the OHS Act, which is the special powers for the inspectors and exercise any of the powers listed in section 30 of the Act in order to monitor compliance with this direction. In so far as any contravention of these directions constitutes a contravention of an obligation or prohibition under the OHS Act, the offenses and penalties provided in section 38 of the Act will apply. An inspector may, for the purpose of promoting, monitoring, and enforcing compliance with the OHS Act, advise employees and employers of their right and obligation in terms of these directions. And thank you, that will be the end of the presentation.
Thank you very much. Uh, that was Ms. Jabuli Elem Shlope uh, from the Department of Employment and Labor, and she dealt with the topic COVID-19 directions and basic ventilation requirements. I thank you very much, Jabu, for taking the time to share your knowledge, experience, and information with the attendees. Much appreciated. Um, can I just ask you a quick question um, before you deactivate your microphone? Am I to understand that there might be sometime in the very near future, perhaps an update on the um, directions? Um, and would it be good enough to ask you now maybe to avail yourself for that future update on our webinar, Jabu? Yes, I can respond that there is a, uh, there, would, there might, there would be an update on the direction and uh, we will be informed once it is gazetted. Thank you very much. And is it okay if we call upon you just to contribute again to our attendees, the uh, new developments in the update? How much are you going to pay me? <laughs> just joking. <laughs> I know, I know. And then also- <laughs> No, we will um, be available. Thank you very much. And then the hazardous biological agents regulations, my understanding is that there's some work being done on that as well. And there could be sometime this year, a, a new version, a newer version being gazetted. Yes, the technical committee has uh, finalized the inclusion of the public comments that we received. Remember it was uh, published for public comments that has been done. So now it's undergoing other processes of it being um, gazetted, but you know, it's a long process, but we hope before the end of this year, we will have the new uh, hazardous biological agents regulations. Okay, well, thank you very much for that. Um, and thank you for your contributions. And just on an admin reminder, I see the hostile people who are typing their questions in the chat box, as per the original and earlier announcement for this webinar, our questions are not answered in the chat box. Questions are answered in the question and answer box, the Q&A box that has the two speech bubbles at the bottom. Please, could I ask all of those people, and I'm not going to mention all of your names. I have already texted you to say that you must type your questions in the question and answer box. And then, um, please, for those who are typing anonymous attendee questions in the question and answer box, um, for the NIH to answer you and to have a good record of who's asked the questions and who we have answered, we are going to ask you to please um, not use the anonymous function in the question and answer box. We prefer to answer and know who we've answered so that our records are clear from our side. So for the uh, attendee that may have used the wrong function there and clicked anonymous attendee, um, uh, hopefully by mistake, please just uh, retype your questions uh, on your own identity and name. Much appreciated. Thank you very much. So our next speaker is Mr. Tobias van Rienen. He's from the Council for Scientific and Industrial Research, the CSIR, and he's dealing with a topic of ventilation guidance for COVID-19. And while he is busy preparing um, his uh, um, uh, slides and microphone, um, I thank him because he's joining us from the Eastern Cape, having a rush back from a site visit to ensure that he's at a venue to see that clear video that you're seeing Toby sharing with us now and uh, for to have a um, good audio connection. Um, so if I could just do something on my side while Toby on your side, you could just, um, I think, prepare your... Um, I'm looking for your bio sketch, Toby. <laughs> I can't find it. So without delaying any further, um, I'm going to ask you just to briefly say something about what you do at the CSIR um, and to proceed with your presentation. My apologies, I, I'm a bit uh, all thumbs this morning. Uh, apologies, I, I think you asked me for a bio sketch um, and I neglected to send you one. So, so I think I have a previous one that I was looking for. So that's no, fine, no, please think, proceed. I think, I think much has changed. I hand um, over to you. Thank you. I, I did try to share my screen and I've got a question here about who can share. Um, so I don't know if I'm a panelist um, or not. I'm available to share. Yeah, you are a panelist um, and you can share, but if you want us to do from our side, I can quickly do that for you. Let me just try again. If I click the wrong button. Sorry, I'm doing it from a laptop and I'm not used to the format. Um, 
apologies for that. No problem. This, um, over here, I'm going to share that and you're probably going to see me looking at myself. Yes, so there you are. If you could maximize the uh, slide or start the slideshow, as they say, and then we will have your full screen. Okay. Perfect. Over All to right. you. Your audio is perfect. Yes, so sir. Thank you, Toby. Thank you. So my name is uh, Toby von Rienen. I'm a uh, mechanical engineer by trade um, and a researcher in uh, airborne infection control and ventilation uh, with the Council for Scientific and Industrial uh, research in South Africa. Um, currently down in the Eastern Cape, we're busy installing CO2 monitors in um, public healthcare facilities, um, uh, CHCs and such, to um, assist in uh, real-time um, monitoring and alarming of indoor air conditions uh, for TB transmission risk uh, specifically. That um, does also assist us with uh, looking at um, uh, COVID transmission risk. Uh, some of the, the uh, factors there are the same. Um, and what we are seeing is, is very interesting and what we've predicted. And you'll, we'll talk about it a little bit more. Um, it's quite rainy and cold down here at the moment. I'm, I'm presenting from my hotel room. Um, but the, uh, it's rainy and cold and everyone's inside, huddled inside with the windows closed. Um, in the last room that I left before I came here, the CO2 levels were more than double uh, what we consider safe indoor levels. So um, uh, not just uh, building ventilation and design, but uh, the way people behave uh, in environments is, is something that uh, we as facility designers and operators uh, need to design around. Anyway, so I've given you the conclusion of my talk. Let's talk about ventilation guidance uh, for COVID-19 specifically. Um, uh, Please uh, stop me if the audio cuts out or if my internet connection is not good or if um, I'm carrying on and you can't hear me. Okay. Do. So first, uh, I just want to make sure that we're all on the same page regarding routes of transmission. Um, traditionally, there are a, uh, I'm just going to move this out of my way so I can see what I'm talking about. There are a number of routes of transmission. Um, they are considered contact droplet airborne fomite uh, and uh, fecal aerosol, fecal oral transmission are um, variations of those. Uh, so as I said, traditionally, um, contact is either, either indirect or direct contact where um, you touch something that is uh, contaminated uh, and that contamination is spread from that object through your hands to the next thing that you contaminate. Um, in, and it can be eyes, nose, um, uh, mouth, that sort of thing. Uh, droplet transmission is, where, uh, is, again, traditionally considered where droplets travel directly from the respiratory tract of the infectious individual through the air uh, to susceptible individuals' mucous membranes. Uh, and also normally considered to be over short distances, and that's where the, the one and a half meters, two and a half meters, you'll, you'll see very, various guidance uh, around that. Uh, also somewhat confusing because different guidelines uh, place different limits on the uh, size of that droplet and the, the range of transmission at which droplet transmission turns into airborne transmission. And then airborne transmission is where aerosols are transmitted by, by the air um, from a source to a susceptible person. Um, that source is often um, a, a respiratory source um, to a susceptible person. Uh, specifically regarding um, SARS, SARS-CoV-2, uh, uh, opportunistic airborne transmission uh, cannot be excluded. In fact, uh, very recently, the CDC has um, uh, fairly emphatically stated um, that it, under certain conditions, it is uh, a real possibility. I'll talk about that in a minute. Um, but where aerosol generating procedures um, are uh, routine, um, the, those procedures are associated with uh, transmission risk. Um, they're a risk factor in multi-bed rooms uh, or shared airspaces. Um, the, one of the questions between droplet and airborne transmission um, is the, uh, the, the viability of those uh, uh, particles in air over long periods of time. Um, and what we know about uh, diseases that are definitely airborne, like tuberculosis, 
is uh, the viability is uh, those those uh, tuberculosis uh, droplet nuclei uh, remain viable for many 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 hours. Uh, in the, in fact, uh, I'm not even sure if there's there's a limit on how long they are, are viable for. Whereas um, uh, viruses like the SARS uh, viruses, the the envelope viruses have a very low viability in the environment. Um, and we'll talk about some of the experiments and studies around viability of, in air of uh, those envelope viruses. Um, so for a uh, um, pathogen to be truly airborne, um, it needs to have long-term viability in the air so that it can travel long distances. Uh, it also needs to be able to survive uh, transit through ventilation systems uh, and between spaces and so on. Uh, and, and that's part of the reason we have uh, some confusion um, and a lot of debate around whether or not uh, SARS-CoV-2 is truly airborne um, in the sense of diseases like TB. Um, and then fomite uh, transmission uh, is, well, fomites are the um, intermediaries uh, for con contact uh, or droplet transmission. Uh, if you have droplets or contact onto a surface that, or an object like money, um, where that uh, onward transmission relies on uh, the transport by those uh, objects, those objects are called uh, fomites and things like um, uh, Staphylococcus aureus uh, and uh, uh, Clos Clostridium um, are uh, typical examples. Um, now, fermite transmission and fecal, uh, fecal aerosol and fecal contact transmission, again, uh, they are uh, just examples of the ones I've shown you before. Um, uh, fetal aerosol transmission I'm bringing up specifically because uh, it's implicated uh, in uh, SARS, some SARS outbreaks. Um, and that's uh, the um, aerosol plumes generated in uh, 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 waste systems, toilet flushing, that sort of thing. Uh, we'll talk about uh, boy gardens, I think, a little bit later. Um, but as, uh, outbreaks, uh, sorry, I've said here that was a COVID-19 outbreak in the Moy Gardens. That's not correct. Um, it was actually a SARS, um, a SARS outbreak. But there have been uh, recorded outbreaks of COVID-19 uh, through plumbing systems in high-rise buildings. And we'll talk about that in a minute. Um, all right. So now no pathogen uh, is, uh, you, you know, only one, uh, only transmits by one route. Uh, sorry, that's not true. <laughs> Most pathogens don't uh, only transmit by one route. Um, we do uh, differentiate uh, between the um, preferability between the modes of transmission. So specifically for airborne, um, we refer to airborne obligate preferential or opportunistic transmission. Um, and again, when we're talking about airborne transmission of uh, SARS-CoV-2 or COVID-19, it's not a matter of whether it is or is not airborne. Um, uh, pathogens like this, under the right conditions, will opportunistically be able to spread by, airborne, uh, by the airborne route. Uh, the question is, what portion of the, the transmission within a population within an outbreak is through uh, the airborne route? And that matters uh, when we look at um, whether it's obligate preferential or airborne. Uh, opportunistic airborne uh, uh, transmission. So um, just to go into it a little bit, the obligate transmission means that um, under, now if you think of tuberculosis for airborne, under natural conditions, diseases occur uh, following transmission of uh, the agent only through the inla inhalation of microscopic particles. So tuberculosis, that's how it spreads. Um, it's not a contact spread um, uh, uh, pathogen and it, it's, it's so all transmission of uh, tuberculosis is uh, through that route. So then tuberculosis is obligate airborne. Uh, preferential route is where this is the route that a, a pathogen prefers to uh, transmit, but it may uh, transmit by other routes. So if it's preferential airborne, that would mean it might be contact, it might be droplet, uh, but it prefers to be preferentially airborne. Um, by definition, that's the natural infection results from transmission through multiple routes, but uh, small particle aerosols are the predominant route. And an example of that would be measles. Um, uh, an example of that 
think by uh, consensus of the scientific community at the moment is uh, it's not uh, SARS-CoV-2 is not preferentially able. Uh, it might be able, but it's not preferentially able, uh, and it's definitely not obligate able. And then we've got opportunistic uh, spread. So opportunistic agents that cause disease are those that cause disease under uh, special con uh, conditions through that route, um, uh, where they might be transmitted via fine aerosols. Um, so this conceptual framework can explain reoccurrences of airborne transmission of agents that are transmitted more frequently by other routes, for example, uh, smallpox and influenza, and uh, some of the outbreaks that are studied um, for uh, COVID-19. Um, and again, in these cases, uh, it's important to remember that the exceptions do not prove the rule. So because there are cases of airborne transmission of COVID-19, doesn't mean that COVID-19 is obligate airborne. Uh, it means that there, it, it is at least opportunistic airborne, and we probably need to understand uh, the drivers of airborne transmission of COVID-19 better. I keep moving my slide along. All right, um, so airborne transmission mechanics. Airborne naturally means carried by the air, and the factors uh, which affect us are multiple. Uh, Airborne environmental conditions uh, such as temperature, humidity, and air velocity vector, uh, vectors um, can assist uh, particles to be carried by the air. Um, the nature of the droplets, that's the size of the droplets and the content of the droplets, matter. Um, you know, if, if a particle cannot remain viable in a small nucleated uh, uh, droplet, um, then it cannot essentially be airborne, or if it has low viability, um, then it cannot be airborne uh, over long distances or airborne uh, through ventilation systems uh, or something like that. Toby, sorry to interrupt. Um, there is a request for you to just increase your audio level. I'm not sure if you might want to move closer to your um, microphone of the laptop. Um, thanks. Apologies for interrupting. <laughs> no, apologies on my side. That's a normal complaint when I talk voice doesn't transmit very well. Uh, I'll, I'll sit closer though. All right, let's talk about the types of organism, um, which affect whether it can be airborne or not. Uh, and that, what matters, and I spoke about this briefly now, is the resilience um, and also the inoculation dose. So uh, pathogens that need a high inoculation dose are typically not airborne uh, because your inoculation doses by the airborne route are uh, generally low. It's one or two particles or you need accumulation of a lot of particles over a long duration of exposure to that contaminated space. Um, and if you look at TB, for example, uh, we know TB is very resilient uh, in a dropiated, dropiated, uh, nucleated droplet, sorry, uh, and uh, the inoculation dose for TB is understood to be very low. Um, it's, it's just a couple of uh, organisms uh, can cause infection. Um, and then another uh, factor which ties back to that inoculation dose is the source strength. Um, so the source strength is what, how much uh, infectious particles or uh, how many infectious particles are generated at what rate uh, at the source. Uh, and aerosol generating procedures, uh, clinical procedures that reduce, reduce, a, lot, produce a lot of aerosols are, um, have been understood right from the beginning to be problematic for uh, COVID-19 and, and uh, risk factor for COVID-19. Um, and if you're listening to some of the news around some of the, uh, and I don't know the names ex uh, exactly um, off the top of my head, but some of the new strains that are being identified um, uh, within the last couple of weeks, some of the concerns are that the, uh, the infection rates and the way they, uh, the virus is um, propagating in the uh, upper respiratory tract is increasing the source strength um, of the infectious person. Um, and increasing the, the uh, uh, likelihood that these newer strains are uh, able. Um, so there are some con uh, concerning uh, trends emerging. Um, singing, for instance, is a, a, a well-known uh, risk factor for COVID-19 transmission. And if you look at some of the uh, CDC guidance talking specifically about airborne transmission uh, for COVID-19, some of the case studies that they use uh, uh, I think they give 10 or so uh, case studies that they analyze, uh, and probably three or four of those outbreaks uh, were choirs. Um, so singing is definitely a, a problem. Uh, and uh, I think I'm, I'm 
simplifying it here, but those that weren't choirs were gyms. Um, so in uh, fitness centers, the doors are closed, uh, the air conditioning's on, um, and uh, everyone's breathing very hard and sweating. So those environments are, are very high uh, generating rate. In fact, the gym here at the hotel, uh, when I walked in this morning, there was a, a lady on a treadmill and she very quickly told me there's more than three in the facility now, so we have to leave the doors open, which I was very pleased to hear. Um, and she proceeded to tell me that one of her friends last week, um, or in the last few weeks, I apologize, um, is, was, has contracted uh, COVID and she contracted it in a gym. So uh, gyms are risky environments uh, for COVID-19. Um, and that's because of the, the increased source strength um, and uh, lower ventilation rates. Um, and when I talk about lower ventilation rates, that's this, that's this contaminant removal rate. Um, so things like ventilation systems, air cleaners, uh, upper room UVGI, uh, those kind of systems have the potential for reducing uh, airborne contaminants. Um, and uh, and in, in, so you increase the contaminant removal rate and therefore you reduce the concentration of contaminants in that space. So in summary, uh, it's complicated. Um, it's not a simple uh, yes, no, it's, uh, it's airborne or not. Um, it, it depends on environmental factors uh, and um, what people are doing uh, in those uh, spaces. So what we know uh, from the earlier strains at least of COVID-19 that it's probably no more airborne than uh, SARS. And that comes from uh, the Van Doren Marlin study that is very often uh, quoted as proving that SARS-CoV-2 uh, survives in air for three hours. Um, that study is widely misunderstood. Um, what that study was actually saying was that it's probably no more airborne than SARS, uh, or the original SARS uh, outbreak. Um, so still, even to this day, uh, SARS-CoV-1 and 2 um, are thought to be not predominantly airborne. Um, it's no longer a matter of it's not airborne. We know that under some conditions it can be airborne or at least slightly airborne, um, but it's definitely not predominantly airborne. The predominant routes of transmission are still thought to be uh, droplet transmission. Uh, transmission, uh, and I just want to point out, this is my own uh, interpretation, how I try and um, level it in my head, is transmission by the air is not the same as transmission through the air. Um, if you if a thing is truly or if a pathogen is truly airborne, um, it is uh, it is transmitted by the air and it can go wherever the air goes um, and it will survive as long as the air does. Um, whereas if it's transmitted through the air, uh, it's might be long range ballistic transmission or some uh, somewhere between droplet and airborne transmission. Um, it's it's a it's a bit of a gray uh, area. And uh, the wonderful thing, there's no wonderful thing about this uh, pandemic, but for researchers, uh, it's really strengthening our understanding of uh, the, um, this gray area between droplet and uh, airborne transmission. All right, so uh, droplet transmission can be uh, ballistic um, while not being truly airborne um, by this definition that uh, it can survive in the air wherever the air goes. Um, ballistic transmission also, the, the range of ballistic transmission can be extended by air jets or in uh, toroidal vortices. Um, and these are like smoke rings. I don't know if you've ever seen the trick where you have a smoke ring generator um, that pops out a smoke ring. Um, and that toroidal vort uh, vort vortex can um, remain intact and keep that smoke together and travel many meters through a room. Um, and uh, the thinking is that uh, coughing, singing, uh, heavy uh, respiratory rates, uh, sneezing, can generate these toroidal vortices and, and uh, extend that with the, rate, the range of ballistic transmission um, with these concentrated uh, clouds uh, for quite a distance uh, through a room under ideal conditions. Um, Long range transmission requires the disease to propagate, uh, as I've said already, with low infectious quanta or high viral shedding. Um, and I've already discussed the difference between uh, TB and SARS-CoV-2. Um, 
this is something I found quite interesting. This is a, a reference from a study by uh, the American Society for Heating and Refrigeration Air Conditioning Engineers, uh, which was talking about um, some of the concerns or, uh, around ventilation and uh, SARS-CoV-2 or COVID-19. And they said that there's a strong negative signal from the Diamond Princess outbreak. I'm sure we all remember that quite clearly. It was just last year, uh, which demonstrated no transmission through recirculating ventilation systems. Um, and that means where uh, two rooms, where uh, passengers were isolated in their rooms and did not contract uh, COVID-19, but were, and weren't in contact with other people, um, but were uh, in a, essentially a shared uh, airspace with other passengers because they were sharing a ventilation system. Um, there was none of that, uh, and that that was an ideal um, laboratory scenario to test this uh, theory. So, uh, as I said, there's a strong negative signal from that study to say that at um, COVID nineteen is at least not as airborne as uh, TB, um, and it does not seem to survive uh, transit through ventilation systems uh, between spaces. Um, so COVID-19 airborne transmission uh, might be some form of uh, opportunistic long-range droplet transmission because it doesn't seem to move from space to space. Uh, oh, that's the end of that slide. I put myself out. What I'd like to talk to you also about is uh, some ventilation metrics. Um, this is something that we're working on in the building regulations, uh, the current build building regulations specifically for uh, healthcare spaces um, refers or, or only defines uh, ventilation capacity for healthcare facilities, or healthcare spaces in terms of air changes per hour. But there are other ways to define ventilation criteria. You can either have air changes per hour uh, or liters per second per person. Now, air changes per hour is uh, a metric where you uh, define how much uh, ventilation you supply to a room based on the size of the room. So if an area has is ventilated at two air changes per hour. It means that the air in that space is turned over or replaced twice uh, every hour. Ideally, uh, there are other things that come into play there. Um, if you're ventilating, however, um, uh, uh, using the liters per second uh, per person criteria, uh, that means that you design the ventilation system based on the number of people in that space. Um, so for both of these scenarios, Oh, wait, I need to explain this to you first. Um, the reason you'd want to ventilate it uh, in terms of liters per second per person is because uh, the concentration of a contaminant in the room is uh, defined by this function. Um, and you'll see that the second term uh, on the, oh, sorry, the first term on the, on the right there, um, on that ratio, we've got the concentration of exhaled uh, breath uh, multiplied by the uh, flow rate of that breath. Um, as a ratio of the supply air. Um, and what would happen there is if you increase the number of people uh, by increasing the flow rate of breath, uh, you're going to increase the concentration in the room. Um, so if you want to keep that concentration in the room steady and increase the number of people, um, what I'm trying to say is if you want to keep the, the risk in that room, the transmission risk in that room uh, steady, while you're increasing the number of people in the room, you need to increase that uh, uh, ventilation rate. So ventilating healthcare spaces in terms of the volume of the room and not the number of people in the room is probably not the right approach. Um, so what happens is if um, for the criteria on the left, the liters per second per person, you double the number of people in a space, which we've seen this morning in some of the healthcare facilities, uh, which are quite crowded down here at the moment, um, you need to have double the ventilation rates. Um, for air changes per hour, uh, if those spaces are uh, have a high occupancy density, higher than normal for that room category, uh, and you're just ventilating, or you've just designed uh, on room volume, um, you are underventilating that space um, and, and creating a high-risk environment. Now, where this comes in for COVID-19 is under our current regulations, we're told we need to decongest these spaces um, and uh, reduce our occupancy, limit the number of people in these, in these rooms. Um, so if we're ventilating, uh, uh, if we designed our ventilation system um, 
to have a certain capacity and we reduce the number of people to half, we effectively have twice the amount of air available per person, which means that room concentration uh, is gonna come down. So that's one of the um, uh, important things that we're uh, doing at the moment. Um, and I wish that <laughs> that would continue for uh, even after COVID-19 uh, for our bigger, uh, national uh, health problem, which uh, I still believe is, is TB. Um, I, I spoke about the CO2 uh, monitors that we're putting up. Um, and in a lot of the facilities, other than today on a cold and wet uh, rainy day uh, in, in the Eastern Cape, uh, we're finding that these healthcare spaces are generally, uh, the, the, air, the indoor air quality is generally very, very good um, because people aren't sitting inside. Um, they, they're all waiting outside for their turn uh, to be allowed into the into the buildings, so the the transmission risk uh, in these indoor spaces, in real terms, is is significantly reduced under COVID nineteen. I wish that would continue. All right, I must move on. I'm going to run out of time. Um, so, look, some of the questions uh, we receive um, and we see uh, interpretations uh, around the guidance is: should you ventilate or not? Should you put your aircons on or not? Um, and this, there's quite a, quite a lot of confusion and it comes from apparently conflicting advice um, uh, between the WHO, ASHRAE um, and the CDC. The, the advice is um, looking more and more the same, although ASHRAE does seem to be a lot more conservative, leading towards ventilation, or leading towards uh, airborne transmission uh, for COVID-19, while the WHO and CDC r remain uh, of the opinion it's predominantly drop it. Um, uh, some um, institutions will tell you you may not use air conditioning uh, during COVID, um, and the question is, is that correct? Uh, we'll talk about that in a minute. So this advice stems from, again, confusing definitions for HVAC um, and uh, weak or conflicting evidence for airborne transmission, uh, specifically the uh, airborne transmission of COVID-19. Um, I think I don't think we're going to have time to talk about contingency operation. Uh, this is testing, maintenance, and cleaning. Even if I don't uh, talk about that and supplementary uh, ventilation systems, uh, I'm sure Moses after me will, will be able to. And uh, I hope someone's going to cut me off in a second when I, I need to stop talking. Okay. So terminology matters. Um, HVAC is heating, ventilation, and air conditioning. Uh, the important thing we're talking about here is ventilation not the air conditioning or the heating. Uh, so those split units are, that we, that we often see all over the place um, are not ventilation. Um, we've spoken about droplet transmission, airborne transmission. I've mentioned ASHRAE is the American Society for Heating, Refrigeration, and Air Conditioning Engineers, and that REVA is the Federation of European HVAC Associations. I want to talk about this outbreak and another two, and I think I'm gonna have to um, uh, step aside after that. Uh, this is the, Guangzhou restaurant outbreak, um, one of the first outbreak studies uh, that made public headlines. Um, it was a restaurant that was poorly ventilated. In fact, it wasn't ventilated at all. It had no ventilation system. The doors and windows were closed and it had a high wall split units. Um, after the outbreak, uh, samples were taken uh, in that air conditioning unit. Um, it's this uh, device here on the top right um, you know, on my plan. Uh, they were all nuclear negative. So we know that so at least from this study, the virus did not survive uh, in the air conditioning system. Um, the transmission was likely long range uh, uh, droplet transmission in this case, modified by the uh, airflow in the room. Um, and these tables were all uh, one, one meter apart. Uh, so it was quite a crowded space. Um, and in this drawing, you don't see all the tables, you just see two rows, there were more tables uh, below this uh, that are not showing in this drawing. Um, some critique of the study has indicated that asymptomatic transmission from the source family is a possibility. Uh, it wasn't sufficiently addressed by the study. Uh, part of the reason for this is at this stage, the uh, proportion of transmission that happened by asymptomatic uh, persons wasn't um, uh, well understood. Um, so it was assumed that only the uh, person A1 here um, 
Mungelo was uh, infectious um, and that the other members of his family uh, were not infectious at that point. However, we do know that they later did um, acquire symptoms. So there is a chance that other members of this family might have been uh, uh, infectious but asymptomatic at that point. Um, we also found from the studies that exposure time correlated with transmission. The tables that spent the most of time, most amount of time close to table A, uh, also got infected. Um, but if this was truly uh, airborne, as uh, TB was, uh, or measles, for instance, we would have seen transmission to tables E and F uh, from the turbulence in that room, as well as to tables below, because the ventilation, well, there was no ventilation in this space. So what, what it seems like happened here is that this high wall air conditioning unit uh, with its horizontal airflow in that space just blew the droplets uh, from table A to B and back, uh, returned back to C. Um, so this is, seems more like a, a modified long range uh, droplet transmission scenario. This is the call, South, uh, South Korean call center outbreak of 2020. It was the 11th floor office. It was poorly ventilated. Um, what we can learn from this is that COVID-19 is exceptionally contagious in crowded office settings like this call center. Um, the outbreak in this building followed the physical compartmentalization of people more than the HVAC compartmentalization of HVAC zone. The, the infection didn't spread through the uh, ventilation system. Um, also interesting at this point was that the lobbies and the lifts resulted in limited spread. So this was on the 11th floor. Um, what we would have expected then is for the, uh, that uh, there would have been a lot of uh, transmission by the uh, surfaces of the vertical transport systems in this building. That never happened. Um, so it, it made uh, researchers uh, realize that uh, contact transmission is probably not as uh, prominent as they thought previously. We also, again, found that exposure time correlated with transmission. Then I mentioned the fund, uh, Doran Marlin uh, report, um, also an early report of last year where they stated a three-hour stability of SARS-CoV-2 in air. And you often hear this three-hour stability, and then the, this is the reference to that claim. Uh, what happened is uh, von Doren Marlin, the von Doren Marlin study uh, was comparing SARS-CoV-1 and 2. And what you, that's all you can do with the Goldberg drum. So von Doren, uh, von Doren Marlin used the Goldberg drum to de determine the stability in air. Um, but if you go look at similar studies for uh, pathogens which are known to definitely not be airborne, such as Ebola, um, there's a similar study, quite recent, that looked at a strain of Ebola uh, using um, the Goldberg drum, also found three-hour stability in air, uh, and then made the claim that that three-hour stability in air was the same as a previous strain that had been studied, and therefore this new strain of Ebola was not airborne. Um, so a three-hour stability in an airborne drum doesn't mean it's airborne. <laughs> it just means that it's the same as another uh, pathogen um, that's been uh, compared to. So that, that report should be understood only as a comparison between SARS-CoV-1 and SARS-CoV-2. Um, and at that stage, SARS-CoV-1 was not thought to be uh, preferentially airborne. Um, it was thought to be opportunistic airborne with very few uh, examples available of airborne transmission. Um, there are emerging reports of airborne transmission um, in high-rise buildings through uh, vertical ventilation stacks in the buildings. But the, uh, these are, if you look at the studies, these are not uh, ventilation stacks, no, not, they're not ventilating systems, they ventilation stacks associated with the um, uh, effluent waste systems in those, in those buildings. And uh, all of the studies that I've looked at, uh, the transmission relates to system failure, plumbing, backing up, uh, in, uh, poorly designed system, that sort of thing. So um, a lot of those transmission events are probably fecal aerosol transmission and not respiratory aerosol transmission. Um, and the dynamics are quite different because of the survivability of the pathogen um, and the source strength uh, of that aerosol. So um, that's, it's, it's, a, it's a special case uh, uh, which needs a specific uh, uh, intentional design um, and uh, um, understanding of, of risks in these kinds of buildings. Um, we often get the question about, uh, but this little pathogen is so small, surely it can pass through a, um, a HEPA filter. Um, HEPA filters filter down to 0.3 microns you hear, um, but this particle is smaller than that, so surely it goes through a HEPA filter. Not entirely true. Um, 
HEPA filters don't work like sieves. They have a number of mechanisms, uh, interception, impaction, and diffusion. Uh, the smaller the particle is, the more effectively it's actually caught in a HEPA filter. It's, it's counterintuitive. Um, this graph will show that um, the diffusion and interception curves, as the particles get smaller uh, to the left of this graph, uh, the filtration efficiency increases. Um, again, with a sieving effect, you get the same to the right. I'm continuing until uh, Ashraf tells me my time is up, um, and I'm sure it is up by now. Um, so the answer to answer the question. Um, Four more minutes, Toby. Are you pardon? Four more minutes, thanks. Okay, good, I'm, I'm rushing. Uh, so to answer the question, HEPA filters are excellent, excellent at capturing tiny, tiny little particles uh, because they don't work like sieves. They use electrostatic effects and so on to, to capture the tiny particles. And the tinier the particle, the better. Um, so don't be concerned about that. There is a most penetrating particle size uh, in a filter where the, fil the combined filtration efficiency dips uh, on this curve over here. Um, so when a HEPA filter is claimed to be 99.95% efficient, that's the efficiency at that point on the curve, uh, at that point on the curve over there, uh, which is highly efficient. So don't worry about it. HEPA filters do work. Um, but for, do we use them for COVID-19? Um, HEPA stands for high, um, high efficiency particulate arrestants or particulate air filters. Um, they're not generally necessary uh, in most of the situations, um, unless you're trying to uh, develop clean rooms, for instance. High filter pressure drops uh, for most ventilation systems may stall ventilation or drastically reduce airflow. There is guidance out there uh, in South Africa as well um, that says you should be installing HEPA filters in your recirculation systems for COVID-19. Be very cautious about doing that. Uh, make sure that that's followed up by a proper risk assessment. Uh, what's likely to happen there is if you don't completely redesign and reinstall a new ventilation system, just installing a HEPA filter means that the pressure drop on that, the, on that uh, ventilation system is going to be so high that your fan can't cope. So instead of having some ventilation, you're going to have no ventilation. Um, your source strength uh, remains the same. Your contaminant removal rates reduce. Concentration in the room goes up, and you end up with more transmission in that space. So you install a HEPA filter and make the problem worse. Um, where what you actually just need is as much ventilation as you can get uh, or reduce the, the occupancy in that space. Um, ASHA recommends no more than uh, equivalent to the SAN standard of an M6 filter, which is a medium filter. It's what you should be putting in your buildings anyway uh, uh, for recirculation. The WHO recommends an F8, uh, which is on the high end of a normal uh, um, general ventilation filter. Um, so anyway, in that range is probably fine. Um, as we just know that the, the, the evidence at the moment seems to indicate that the virus is too fragile to survive transit through a ventilation system anyway. So that filter is probably doing uh, minimal work anyway um, at retaining uh, or arresting those, uh, those viruses. Um, so if you're exhausting air from uh, healthcare spaces or high-risk spaces, make sure that that air is discharged safely. Uh, you can do that without HEPA filtration or uh, ultraviolet germicidal radiation decontamination of that space. Um, just make sure that you doing that safely and not discharging that air back into another ventilation system, open window, children's play, playground, that sort of thing. Make sure you're discharging it safely away into the air. Uh, those, this, this virus dies very quickly uh, out in the open. So um, you can discharge safely without uh, crazy amounts of filtration and other measures. Um, should you use your HVAC system? Uh, if it's improving your ventilation rate, yes. Um, if, it's, if your HVAC system is only the A portion of HVAC, which is air conditioning, um, probably not if you can't introduce some ventilation at the same time. Um, you need to increase your ventilation to more than double the regulatory minimum uh, per person ventilation rates. Uh, this is just a, a guideline. Uh, it's, not a, it's not written anywhere, uh, if possible, or reduce the number of people to half. So, if you can't increase your ventilation rates, reduce the number of people. Um, obviously, more outdoor air is better. Uh, I'm not saying you shouldn't uh, recirculate. I've seen guidance that says you should not recirculate. I don't believe there's evidence for that. 
uh, for general spaces. Uh, obviously, for high-risk healthcare spaces, we haven't been recirculating previously for the same reason. We still shouldn't recirculate. Um, but um, yeah, uh, more outdoor air is better, and you can't get better ventilation than opening your windows. Um, so wherever possible, make sure you do that. Um, circulating fans within a room. Um, these are pedestal fans, ceiling fans, or so on, do improve your ventilation effectiveness. I said previously that I, sp I spoke about uh, 12 air changes, oh, sorry, two air changes being two air turnovers of, turnovers of air per uh, hour um, in an ideal situation. But if these rooms aren't perfectly effective, uh, they never can be. Um, and there's some loss in putting, uh, including circulating fans into a space increases, increases that ventilation effectiveness. It prevents stagnation in the corners of a room. Um, however, from that uh, Guangzhou restaurant uh, outbreak, we've learned, don't let your AC units or fans blow directly uh, down across groups of people. You need to limit this horizontal airflow because that can increase the droplet transmission rate. Um, consider CO2 monitoring like, we, like we're doing down in the Eastern Cape at the moment. Um, the regulations at the moment don't allow for it. The, Next version of the uh, building regulations will, however, uh, allow it with some uh, caveats. Um, you, you can do CO2 monitoring uh, at the MON control where your ventilation system uh, increases your uh, fresh air rate as the occupancy increases in the room. Um, be careful, however, that we don't reduce those vent baseline ventilation rates too much uh, when people leave that space uh, because you need to keep these uh, air moving in these, in these areas. Um, to get rid of the pathogens that people left behind. Uh, Reva, that's the European equivalent of ASHRAE, uh, recommends CO2 uh, set points of 550 ppm, which is coincidentally right on the target that we normally set for CO2. Uh, it's plus minus um, 50 ppm. Uh, plus, sorry, did I say for CO2, I mean for uh, tuberculosis. Um, and this equates to about 40 liters per second per person, uh, which is, is very high. Um, General ventilation rates for offices in that are typically between seven and 10 liters per second per person. So this is a lot of air, um, difficult to achieve with your existing uh, currently installed ventilation systems, which is why we recommend opening windows. Uh, not always easy to do if it's cold outside. Uh, the CSR recommends um, no more than uh, 200 ppm above outdoor for TV. I've actually reduced that a little bit uh, quite recently down to about 180 ppm above outdoor for TB, uh, which equates to about 32 liters per second. So it's, it's you know, very close to uh, what we're talking about for uh, TB for COVID. Temperature and RH control is not feasible. Um, studies have shown that we need temperatures of 56 degrees Celsius uh, and RH, uh, that's relative humidity of greater than 60%. At those temperatures and humidities, you'll be killing people before you kill uh, the, the virus. So don't do that, that's not gonna work. Um, it's recommended uh, for offices, for instance, you, that you flush your buildings for two hours uh, before and after daily uh, occupation. Um, if you've got exhaust fans running uh, in bathrooms and toilets, that sort of thing, run them 24 seven. They've never switched them off. We know about the risks of bathrooms now, um, but this flushing of buildings uh, allows it to get rid of contaminants so they don't hang around uh, until the next day. Although I don't think that is really such a risk um, for airborne contamination. Um, we don't, although you don't want those particles to settle out. Um, you need to reduce your recirculation to as low as reasonably um, achievable for low-risk buildings. Uh, and then again, as I said, for high-risk healthcare spaces, no recirculation. But we weren't doing that previously. We shouldn't be doing that now. Um, I think I'm out of time. Um, I'm not going to get into the WHO, CDC, and ASHRAE debate. Um, uh, I wanted to talk about maintenance and cleaning. Essentially, what I'm saying here is uh, make sure that your staff uh, are properly trained, um, but the risks are relatively low. Use the normal PPE. Um, don't use special detergents, especially not in ventilation systems. Uh, chlorines, chloramides, those sort of things can be respiratory problems. Don't go cleaning your ducting with chlorine uh, or chlorine-based products. Um, soap and water, it's good. Uh, soap's uh, at least as effective as uh, uh, most of our sanitizers are killing this uh, virus. Um, some would say it's even better. Um, for our air conditioning systems, uh, as I said, cleaning with soap and water is acceptable. Um, regular cleaning of your blower coil should have been done. Uh, now, 
no time like the present uh, to catch up on your maintenance. Uh, you should be putting biocide in your drip trays. Uh, you were doing it previously, do it now. Um, and then check the material data, uh, material safety data sheets of any disinfectants you intend on using. And I've said, don't use chlorine with chloramines, hypochlorous acid fumes. Uh, they can generate uh, fumes in your ventilation system, uh, which you don't want. Um, this is quite an old uh, recommendation. I'm still keeping it together, which is to store old recirculation filters for a week before disposing them. Um, I'm not sure, there's no evidence that this uh, virus survives uh, on these filters or in the ventilation system. So there's very little chance of onward transmission. Um, but the rec I think it's better to be safe than sorry, and this doesn't cost you anything. Uh, so before you throw those filters out, just keep them in, uh, safely somewhere in stock for a week before you dispose of them. Toby, uh, I have to cut you now. Uh, thank you. Um, I see that you have approximately uh, about five slides left, and I definitely want to invite you back for a follow-up when the um, directives uh, have directions have been updated and gazetted. Would you be agreeable to join us again for a, a, a refresher update a session, and then you know we can ensure that you get all of the slides covered that you still wanted to share with our attendees. Is that okay with you? I have run on a little bit and I've jumped ahead of myself. Um, so if I can just make these four points, then I'm done. Um, okay, go for it. I am happy, I am happy to uh, speak Join about again. this through at any point. As I said, this has been a wonderful opportunity for researchers to learn more about airborne transmission. Um, and my understanding and my opinions have changed over the last year. So if you listen to me last year, uh, I'm probably got a slightly different message now. If you listen to me next week, it'll probably change again. Um, so these four points are now as valid as ever. I've already said it, decongest your indoor spaces. Ventilate as well as possible um, to within the building uh, regulations criteria. Uh, restore your ventilation systems to full operation uh, if, they, if you haven't uh, got them operating as they should have been. Uh, if you've um, been neglecting on maintenance, make sure that that's in place. Um, and resist investing in miracle technologies like portable air cleaners, uh, photocatalytic oxidation. Uh, outside the passage of my hotel room is some UV ozone generating device, which I'm very suspicious of, which I know definitely doesn't work in this environment. So don't waste your money on that. Uh, just follow the guidelines that are there uh, and don't look for miracle solutions. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, that's uh, Toby uh, Tobias van Rienen from the Council for Scientific and Industrial Research, the CSIR, dealing very thoroughly with the topic ventilation during COVID-19, uh, sorry, ventilation guidance for COVID-19. And you'll notice he's got much more to share. Uh, this topic is not going to disappear. I think it's going to be one of those hot topics um, for a while to come. Um, because this is also linked to those routes of transmissions that Toby dealt with in the, the, the various routes in so much detail earlier. And as he's indicated, things are unfolding and developing all the time as new information, new research and new science becomes available. So Toby's going to become one of our regulars <laughs> on our webinars. And so Toby, thank you very much for joining us today. We appreciate your time that you've taken off. And I know that you've got to rush back to your site um, to complete the work for the CSIR there in the Eastern Cape. Very much appreciated that you have taken the time and returned to your venue to be able to join us. Toby, thank you. Okay, yeah, um, you, go ahead. If you don't mind, I'll, I'll run through the Q&A sessions and answer some of the questions. Uh, yes, please. Thank you very much. Great. Thank you. Okay, so our next speaker is Moses Mokone, and I owe him a full 30 minutes for his contribution. He is a member of the NIH staff and part of the occupational hygiene section here at the NIH. And Moses is going to deal with the um, topic of ventilation during COVID-19 pandemic, an occupational hygiene perspective or looking at it from an occupational hygiene point of view. Moses, um, if you could just uh, unshare, uh, Toby, your uh, slide presentation. And Moses will share his slide presentations in a moment and check his microphone. And by way of introduction, 
Uh, Moses Mokone is an occupational hygienist registered with the South African Institute for Occupational Hygiene, shortly known as SIO, and holds a Bachelor of Technology degree in Environmental Health, currently studying for a Master's degree in Public Health, that's an MPH, specializing in occupational hygiene at the University, the university of Witwatersrand, Wits University for short. Um, so Moses is currently employed here, as I said, as an occupational hygienist at the NIH, and he's got more than 10 years of work experience in the field of occupational and environmental health, having worked as an occupational hygiene consultant and occupational hygiene specialist at, in various sectors, including, as he said, consulting in the mining and other industries, petrochemical and government. So Moses Mokoni serves as a council member of the SIO, that's the South African Institute for Occupational Hygiene, and his portfolio is to manage or coordinate all activities in the SIO branches. Moses, thank you very much for taking time to join us on this webinar. I'm going to, I see your slide is already shared. If you could test your audio and I'll hand over to you immediately. All right, thank you so much, uh, Ashraf. I hope you can hear me. Yes, perfectly, please proceed. All right, uh, good, uh, good afternoon, everyone. And, and thank you for joining uh, this presentation. So I will be talking about ventilation during uh, COVID-19 pandemic and, and looking at it from occupational hygiene point of view as, as Ashraf has spoken. And um, so for some of you who might not know what occupational hygiene is, so internationally occupational hygiene is defined as the science and art, you know, um, devoted for the identification, evaluation and control of uh, health hazards in the workplace and, and with the objective of promoting worker health and, and, and also safeguarding the community uh, at large. And, and ventilation on, on its own, just to briefly talk about it, what it is. So it's the process of supplying air into a building and also removing the very same air which might be contaminated. And in order to make sure that the contaminants in the building are, are, are reduced, and that can be done through either natural or mechanical ventilation. So uh, giving a bit of a background, uh, as we, we know that COVID-19 cases, are, uh, we see that they are increasing a year after the outbreak. And of course, the ability to manage uh, the pandemic uh, has improved. We see that vaccines are available and, and, and controls in terms of uh, controlling the infections, we can see that. However, with vaccines, we know that they do not provide, you know, uh, immediate relief. So meaning that other controls are still important. And the debate remains uh, about how this uh, COVID-19 uh, is, is transmitted. Uh, my colleague Toby has spoken about that. And we've seen last year about more than 200 scientists actually uh, written a public letter saying that, you know, the airborne route transmission has to be acknowledged. And we know that uh, currently the main routes are droplets, aerosols, including formides, of course. And we'll, initially it was thought that this was not via airborne. And uh, we've seen WHO and CDC updating their information to reflect that. And CDC has also you know, uh, indicated that these particles can actually travel at distances beyond two meters. And WHO also uh, indicating that you know, the risk of, of transmission is in places that are inadequately ventilated and also where people are crowded. And now this also takes to the topic of today, which is ventilation. It's very important, and especially considering the time that most of us now during winter will be, will be spending time indoors. And there are different guidelines and, of course, legal requirements that are linked to um, you know, how we should uh, uh, comply with requirements for COVID-19 and uh, the directions from Department of Employment Labor, Regulation 5 of Environmental Regulation for Workplaces. And I must say that, you know, the requirements for ventilation is not something new and it, not, it, 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 it did not start during the pandemic. So ventilation has been, the requirements for ventilation has been there as you can see there on also the national building regulations, which was in 2011 has got you know, some requirements in terms of natural and mechanical ventilation. 
and of course other guidelines like the WHO, international labor organizations, and the two you know, powerful international organizations, ASHRAE and RIVA. And you know, I've seen recently these two organizations have actually signed a memorandum of understanding to make sure that, and, and actually agreeing that they, what they are putting out there as guidance, they agree in most of what they are saying. But of course, there are differences there and there, as Toby was trying to highlight the differences, and especially about uh, filtration requirements, ventilation rates, and so forth. But these are guidelines that are there, and people can look up to them. And now we, we know that most of our policy are derived from how the COVID-19 is, uh, is, is actually transmitted. And uh, so we know that you know the what differentiates a droplet and aerosol is actually a five microns, uh, and 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 as you can see here, so the larger droplets are, are regarded as being greater than or more than ten micrometers. As you can see in the diagram, if someone is coughing and this is actually a source which is infected person, and they release droplets which are available. In the air and those droplets uh, during uh, that uh, process, they now get transmitted through a pathway. So a pathway is between the infected person and the receptor. And those droplets now become aerosols or what is called as droplet nuclei, and they become airborne. And we know that there is debate about if COVID, if SARS-CoV-2 is it airborne or not. But these are identified routes of, of transmission. And of course, formite, as we can see that if one is coughing, that can land up on surfaces, contaminate surface. If we touch the surface, we can still expose ourselves and this can be direct as well. And of course, with droplets, they can, go, they can uh, infect someone directly uh, if one is, is in, in close proximity. And also fecal oral uh, aerosol route. Uh, so especially after you know using the toilet, so it is recommended that before you flush it, you close the lid, and because that will avoid those particles being emitted, and that can still you know be one of the route that this virus can be transmitted. And that is important to understand how this is transmitted, because most of our interventions are derived from these uh, principles. And of course, we, we, um, my colleagues have talked about uh, ventilation, I mean, risk assessment. So I'm not gonna go in details on, on that, but uh, to help you guide uh, decide which actions to take, you need to carry out an appropriate risk assessment, just as you would for other health and safety related hazards. And this assessment must be done in consultation you know, with relevant stakeholders. And of course, as you can see on the diagram there, a risk assessment, it should be a continuous you know, process. If uh, processes in your workplace are changing, that needs to be revisited and make sure that you know, all what is happening in the workplace is reflected. And of course, the risk needs to be ranked. For example, you can see we've got very high and a lower risk uh, 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 ranking. So this helps with the you know, actions that one will take when uh, looking at the risk assessment. And it's not one size fits all. So each situation is different and a proper risk assessment needs to be uh, conducted. And that should be done in order of priority as well. So we know that there are other different factors that are affecting the indoor environment. And the indoor environment, we're talking about indoor air quality. So we have outdoor air, and outdoor air comprises of, you know, other, you know, contaminants like your vehicle emissions, wildfire, and so forth. And that outdoor air is the all outdoor air that we're saying that should be supplied in the indoor spaces. And for that air to go through the building, so it needs to be, you know, either through mechanical ventilation, natural ventilation or other openings in the buildings, like what we call infiltration. And then as the air gets into a building, as you can see there, that's something like a filter. So that air needs to be filtered. And in the indoor environment, this is where we spend most of our time. 
And of course, there can be respiratory aerosols like coronavirus we talk about, and other form of contaminants like your VOCs and carbon dioxide that we talk about. And the air that is being flushed out then gets exhausted out of the building. So this is just typically to show how you know, indoor air quality and other factors can affect you know, uh, indoor air quality as we see. It. So the basics of, of how a ventilation system operates uh, from occupational hygiene point of view, it is important to also understand how the system operates. And, and we know that the air that is being supplied into the building, you know, comprise of outdoor air and return air. So I'm just gonna describe on this on this diagram here, just show you that as the air that's been supplied into a building, the air, if the system that has been used is the one that is recirculating the air. For example, as you can see, this air that is leaving the building will go back together and mixed with the outdoor air. So as the air enters the building, it will be filtered. Of course, there are fans that are pulling the air and they are cooling and heating you know, mechanisms. If it's winter like now, we are the air will be heated up and that air will be supplied. So the air that is supplied here, if the system is recirculating, will be a combination of outdoor air and return air, and that's what we call supply air. And so when the air, as the air is being returned, so some systems like in your, you know, aerosol generating procedure uh, facilities, so the air would be, you know, 100% outdoor air and 100% return air. So the air is normally not recirculated. But this is just a typical example of how a, a, a ventilation system would look like and how the air is being moved around in a building. And we often talk about recirculation and recirculation simply means that a certain percentage of air is being returned but make sure that that uh, gets filtered. We talk about HEPA filters and other type of media. So that needs to be in place to make sure. So types of ventilation, we have mechanical ventilation, we have natural ventilation. As you can see there on the diagram, for example, uh, so mechanical ventilation, we talk about the, like your HVAC system, and this type of system, they allow for filtration. They are mostly reliable uh, apart from now because load shading and so forth. So that might be a challenge. So they require fan to run, can be automated. And of course, energy cost is also important because you need to heat and cool the air and maintenance are also very important. So that's what we, we when we talk about uh, mechanical ventilation, that's what we refer. And of course, you know, other means of ventilation is natural ventilation. And this can be through windows, this can be through doors or other intentional openings in a building. And, and another thing about this is the natural ventilation may not provide adequate airflow and simply because the air that enters the building might, might, might be, you know, a variable. So, and, and also another thing is the security concerns if people are opening windows, you know, there can be noise from the outside, comfort issues when it's winter, opening the windows. And also because the natural ventilation does not have filtration in most cases. And that's when you find that you might end up, you know, getting dust and other pollen, you know, in the, into the building. So that just shows, you know, the different types of, you know, uh, ventilations, which are very important in the situation we are when looking at uh, COVID-19. And so one would also ask, but how do I evaluate these requirements and make sure that I have the required ventilation rates? So there are of course different, you know, instrumentation that are used, particularly in occupational hygiene space, evaluate the ventilation system. Uh, so we have a capture hood and we have a carbon dioxide monitor, uh, air velocity, smoke tube, which is important that you, you get to visualize, you know, the, uh, the patterns of the airflow in, 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 a, in, a, in a building. 
And of course, in order to use this type of instrument, you need a step ladder because you know sometimes you find when you're dealing with uh, measuring uh, diffusers which are mounted in a ceiling, you need uh, you know step ladder and you need to measure distance or, or dimensions of the room. So this is how you know one would go about taking you know ventilation measurements and you know all the instruments that are used they have manuals and those manuals needs to be you know followed and also you know you need to you know have detailed description of the ventilation system you need to know if system is uh, supplying 100% air or if the system is recirculating and all those you know technical information about the system and of course measuring the room dimension it's, it's important and then uh, this use of smoke tube will actually help in terms of visualizing the airflow and uh, so the airflow the ventilation rate is measured in meter cube per hour as you can see in the diagram here, this is a, a um, capture wood. So it measures the, uh, the, uh, the volumetric airflow in the conference room. So this instrument is actually giving the airflow in terms of cubic uh, meters per hour. And this is a diffuser. And as you can see on the diagram, the diagram is actually encapsulating the diffuser which supplies air. And these, they come in different shapes, types, and sizes. And of course, there's a return grill as well. As you can see, in most buildings, there will be a supply and where the air will be taken out. So it's a supply and a return. So, and that is important to make sure that uh, that is captured correctly uh, as one is measuring. And there are other techniques uh, that one can use uh, if one to want to evaluate uh, ventilation in a building. And we, we have heard that you know, carbon dioxide levels can be used as a proxy for ventilation rate. And you know, that alone, you know, there needs to be source of CO2. Usually the building needs to be you know, occupied uh, when one is you know, checking the CO2 levels. And uh, generally it says that, you know, um, if the carbon dioxide concentration in a building is more than 100, 1,000 parts per million, it, it sort of, you know, it's an easy indicator of, you know, to show that the ventilation rates are inadequate. And um, so other guidelines are saying that, you know, the levels should not exceed roughly 700 ppm more than the outside ambient air. So we know roughly the ambient CO2 levels is between 350 to about 500 ppm. And then when you add that to 700, you should get roughly 1,000 or 1,002. So there are, also, there are also other techniques that are used to you know, estimate that a temperature can be used as well. And a tracer gas method, as you can see that actually the tracer gas method does not need building to be occupied because that's more like an experimental type of an assessment and it can use these different gases so it can use nitrous oxide sulfur hexafluoride or carbon dioxide and those gases can be used to, to do that and there of course there is an equation that one can use when one to you know um, uh, derive the ventilation rate using this uh, co2 and temperature techniques so how to work out ventilation rates? Um, there are you know, formulas or equations. So we often talk about you know, air changes per hour. So air changes per hour simply means that it is the outdoor air that is being supplied into the building. You divide that by the room volume. So all those have shown that where you need to take the different you know, measurements of the room to make sure that you can derive your air changes per hour. As you can see here in this um, uh, extract from a uh, sun's code, which is our local uh, standard. So it, if, for example, it requires that in an assembly hall, there should be 10 air changes per hour. And this refers to outdoor air. And so uh, one needs to do that calculation to check if they comply with the standard. And uh, my colleague Toby has focused on liters per second per person. And it is also mentioned here in our local standard. And, uh, and we know that the WHO has recently published you know, their guidance. And actually, 
say that in, where, in areas where aerosol generating procedures are conducted, they recommend that 12 air changes per hour uh, or 160 liters uh, per second uh, be you know, um, complied with. But in non-healthcare settings, like in the general offices, you know, they recommend that you know, 10 uh, liters per second per person you know, be complied with. And then this one, the 10 liters per second per person, as Toby has mentioned, it actually you know, depends on the occupancy rate. If the building is, if, if, if you see that you don't meet this 10 liters per second per person, obviously the building uh, occupancy can be reduced because as you reduce the occupancy, it means that now people in the building will have more you know, ventilation rates. And as we see that with the social distancing measures that we put uh, currently, you know, buildings automatically are less occupied because, you know, there's enough space. So that uh, also needs to be um, complied with. So these are just, you know, general control measures. And it is recommended that we increase the ventilation rate to 100% outdoor if possible. And if that is not possible, obviously one would recirculate the air. And uh, it, the recirculation of the air needs to be reduced. And then also when the air has been recirculated in a building, you know, uh, uh, enhanced filtration uh, is, is actually recommended. We talk about HEPA filters, we talk about MERV steady, we talk about EPM1, EPM2.5 uh, and so forth. And these are recommended by, you know, various uh, uh, um, you know, agencies. So that needs to be uh, taken into consideration. And, uh, you know, the, also in terms of the bathrooms, so it is recommended that the exhaust fans in the bathrooms or in the toilets should run 24 hours a day. So uh, 24 hours. So in that they should be kept under negative pressure. And because negative pressure simply means that you make sure that the contaminant in the bathroom does not you know, escape to the adjacent areas uh, because if it's not under negative pressure, those contaminants will be able to leave the room and, uh, and contaminate uh, adjacent areas. And of course, open windows and doors if it is safe and weather allows. And this is important because we know that if uh, um, a building does not have mechanical ventilation, you know, we, it is recommended that windows and doors be opened in order to meet, you know, ventilation rate. And I did mention about reducing occupants in areas where outdoor ventilation cannot be increased to the optimal amount. The use of fans to increase the effectiveness of open windows. So this usually, if you have a window, like I've mentioned that natural ventilation, for example, can be can vary depending on weather conditions. So if you put a, a, a fan next to a window, that actually helps with pulling the air into the, into the building. And that is also one of the controls that one can consider. And of course, because the ventilation system on its own, it's a very complex uh, system. So one needs to consult the professional engineer or HVAC specialist. Um, to determine the best way to maximize the system's ventilation and air filtration uh, capabilities, as we have seen that, or if you have heard that there are different requirements, but this needs to be done thoroughly through risk assessment and consultation with relevant specialists. And this diagram simply just shows, you know, a combination of, of controls in, in a typical, you know, indoor environment. And we see that, you know, this is when the air is being recirculated. And here they say that recirculation to be avoided if possible. And of course, you have UVG ILM that uh, you know, inactivate the virus. And you've got portable air cleaners that are also recommended uh, to be used. And actually, uh, those that are available, they can give up to two to five you know, air changes per hour. And that we see that in terms of Natural ventilation, cross ventilation is recommended uh, in, in, in such spaces where there is no mechanical ventilation. 
And uh, so my take home message on this is that uh, we have seen that the complexity of evaluating ventilation. So it is important to follow the accepted occupational hygiene principles such as identification, evaluation and control to its fullest extent. And as buildings become more energy efficient, there should be a balance between adequate ventilation rates and thermal comfort, uh, especially now because it's winter, people are closing windows and so forth. But there are still requirements in terms of you know, ventilation rates that one uh, we need to comply with, especially building owners and so forth. And that is very important. And uh, yeah, thank you so much. And thank you for listening. Thank you, Ashraf. Thank you very much, Moses. That's uh, Moses Mokone, uh, the colleague in the occupational hygiene section here at the NIH, dealing with the topic of ventilation during COVID-19 epidemic, pandemic, apologies, ventilation during COVID-19 pandemic from an occupational hygiene perspective. Very much appreciated. And uh, before I start giggling with Mr. Bean on the screen, <laughs> uh, Moses, if you could just thank you very much. Um, okay, so we've had lots of questions in the Q&A box. And I know that Moses may have some questions there that's directed to him. At least one, I think somebody also said um, Moses directly in the text there. But let me start off with our, our two earlier presenters. And that is uh, Jabulile and uh, Toby. Um, you've seen the questions in the question and answer box. Um, uh, do you have any specific uh, sort of major trends amongst the questions there? You can also look obviously at the questions that have already been answered that you just want to address in the final few minutes that we have. We were about five minutes or so left for the session. Um, that you may want to address um, either uh, Jabu Lele or uh, Tobias. Uh, Jabu or Toby, um, you could just, I'll just watch. Okay, um, if, if you open your microphone. Moses, if you could just also look at some of the questions in the question answer box there that may be of interest to you. So any of the colleagues who may want to provide some overall comments or address some of the trends there in the question answer box. Uh, Toby, are you ready? Uh, yes, uh, someone, and I've, I've already answered the question, so it's off my page here, um, so I can't give credit to where it's due. Uh, someone asked a, a, an excellent question around does heating affect, um, does vent, do ventilation systems and heating affect the uh, COVID transmission risk? Um, and, and that is a very good question. And unfortunately, the answer is yes. Um, and, and the reason for that is it's got nothing to do with the heating. It's got nothing to do with the, the conditions in the room. Uh, it's got to do with the poor way in which engineers design your ventilation systems. So your normal office air conditioning, where you've got supply uh, and return in the ceiling, um, we do it like that because it's the cheapest uh, and we don't want to pay our engineers uh, lots of money to design us better systems. So what happens is uh, in these so you've got a, a supply and, and a return uh, in your system and it's supplying warm air and, and extracting warm air out of your uh, space. Um, but warm, well, you all know warm air rises. So it tries to blow warm air down into the room. It rises straight back up and then gets extracted out before it gets into the room. Um, so I don't know if you've experienced when you walk into a room uh, that's heating, uh, that's warm uh, in winter, with it, even though the ventilation system is running, you often feel that those rooms are stuffy. And, and that, this is the reason for it. You've got short circuiting uh, between your supply and your return. You're not actually ventilating the room. So the occupied space is stagnant. Uh, and the ventilation is happening up at the ceiling. Uh, you get this, this striated effect. So that is something that I hadn't thought about before. It's an excellent question. Um, and we probably need to be cautious about overheating our spaces, um, especially if you've got those kinds of ventilation systems, because it means that we're not actually ventilating the occupied space. So keep the temperatures as low as you can um, comfortably uh, achieve to avoid that condition. Um, and I'm going to add that into my presentation the next time I'm invited back. Great. Uh, and you can see my thick jacket. 
keeping the temperature <laughs> as low as possible. Not that this aircon is actually working uh, in heating up. Okay, that was Wayne Fortain's question to you, Toby. And if you click on the answer uh, tab in the middle of the question and answer box, you'll see some of the questions that's there and that have already been answered. So thanks for that, Toby. Um, Tabu, any final comments from your side? Um, any uh, trend in the questions that you've noticed there before I ask uh, Moses to provide comments? Thanks, Chabu. Okay, yeah, I think I managed to answer all the questions that were asked uh, regarding the direction. So I don't have any other inputs, but just to say that I think one person asked what would be the best measure to, 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 to put in place, especially for those employees traveling with the public transport. Now, as we see the third wave coming in. So that one, it's, it's a bit challenging, but the, it's just personal hygiene, wear your mask, uh, sanitize and also opening the windows. Though sometimes when you're in a taxi, I'm not sure how um, cooperative the drivers are or other passengers to keep windows open, but that's the, the things that I thought about when we, she was talking about the, the public transport. Well, thank you very much for that. Um, um, there was one question, Jabu, and I answered the person. Uh, regarding when the bill, um, I think, will be published, the Occupational Health and Safety Bill. And my response was that it's best for that person to direct the question to the Department of Employment and Labor, because as presenters, my sense is that uh, none of us have a clear, direct answer to that. Um, any, any advice to that particular individual who um, they should contact around that? They can send the inquiry to the Chief Inspector. Thank you very much. That short brief and to the point. Okay, and then Moses, um, any comments or questions uh, from your side around the, sorry, comments or answers in terms of the trends that have been there around the questions that you may want to address uh, before we close? And if there are any of our panelists who have been supporting answering the questions in the background, who may want to chip in a quick comment around the trends around the questions, I would certainly be willing to allow that in the next minute or two. Moses, over to you. Thank you so much, Ashraf. Um, yeah, well, I, from what I can see here is, um, I think someone asked about, you know, seeing that the spread of COVID-19, you know, in winter compared to summer. So, but uh, I understand that can be, you know, different, you know, factors that uh, play to that. And, but in terms of ventilation, we know that, you know, during winters, people tend to, you know, close windows and that sort of limits, you know, uh, natural ventilation, particularly in areas where there isn't any other means of ventilation. And, and that, you know, can affect, you know, uh, the transmission. And, uh, and in, in summer, we know that, you know, that we tend to, you know, need more fresh air because it's much hot, it's much hot in the building. So that can somehow be a link between that. But yeah, not ruling out other factors that might, you know, play in that. And also, you know, on how, you know, one can, you know, measure and ensure that uh, they are getting sufficient air in the room. Uh, so I've spoken about different techniques, uh, like, you know, just having your carbon dioxide uh, levels measured in a room, and, and that can give you, you know, an easy indication of if your ventilation is sufficient uh, or, or not. And, uh, you know, some buildings, they actually install sensors in a building, and actually there will be an alarm that goes off if the level exceeds, you know, a certain, let's say if it exceeds 800, so the alarm will go off to warn them that there's no enough ventilation. So those are easy you know, techniques that can be used. Uh, of course, there are other ways, you know, by quantifying the uh, amount of air that is being supplied in, in, in a building. And uh, yeah, I think those are some of the trends that I can see here. And, and also, you know, uh, mentioning that um, what Toby has mentioned about air conditioners that 
you know, there's a question about uh, if we are only using air cons, is it, you know, recommended? And we've seen that there are ventilation rates that are recommended. So if you cannot meet those ventilation rates, it means, you know, you, you sort of, your room does not comply with the ventilation requirements because air conditioner on its own is just conditioning the air. So it's either heating or cooling and just recirculating the air, but one still needs, you know, as some form of fresh air into the building that helps with the dilution of air contaminants. And especially in uh, spaces that are being shared in offices and so forth. And of course, maintenance of the system is also very important to ensure that it operates you know, at, at, as uh, manufacturers' uh, instructions. Yeah, I think- uh, Thank you very much, Moses. I'm going to ask Toby to just step in again. I see he's raised his hand uh, for a final comment there. Um, there are still some questions, Moses, that's still addressed to you also in the question answer box, if you could just assist in addressing those. Over to you, Toby, thanks. Uh, I've just noticed in a, lo a lot of the questions are asking about uh, or questioning why they should use HEPA filters. Um, and I, I must have uh, spoken badly. I apologize for that. Uh, my recommendation for general spaces is don't worry about HEPA filters. Um, they are, by most uh, institutional guidance documents, not recommended um, because your ventilation system probably couldn't handle them. And they'll just cost you too much and give you very little benefit. So uh, return to the, the filtration systems you should have had in place in the first place, which is a good quality medium or fine filter as your, as your final or secondary filter. Um, don't be, unless you're doing something special, don't be too concerned about using HEPA filters. Uh, you're still on mute. Sorry, just to put this to you before you go. Thanks, uh, Toby. Wayne Fortain's asked again uh, on his previous question, is it safe to make use of fogging cans to reduce the spread of the virus in office spaces after it's been used during meetings, etc.? I'm sure you got a very quick brief uh, answer for um, Wayne on that fogging uh, question. Toby? Uh, do not fog a room while it's occupied. You can fog to your heart's content uh, as long as your materials and environment uh, can handle the chemicals, uh, but know what you are fogging with. Um, so, you know, so that you understand the any adverse effects uh, to people and uh, materials, but you don't fog an occupied room, uh, please. That's not allowed. And don't use Thank you ozone. very much. Thank you very much. <laughs> and don't use ozone. Yes. Uh, Great. <laughs> Thanks, Obi. That's where we concluded. We can't take it further than this. Um, we have run slightly over our time and we thank you for your patience and your um, endurance in staying with us. There is another session starting at one o'clock and I do have to hand over back to my IT colleagues on this particular webinar. There is just one comment made. I see there's about seven questions left open. I'm gonna ask our presenters just to address those. I'm gonna close one of them. And that's from George Jacobs saying that the bill was sent out for comments and suggestions. Closing date for comments, public comments on the occupation of the safety bill as I think he's referring to is the 31st of July. So um, whilst my colleagues, uh, the presenters and panelists deal with the six remaining questions there, I want to thank all of you for joining us, as well as our presenters, and that's Ms. Jabulele Mshlope from the Department of Employment and Labor, who dealt with COVID-19 directions in basic ventilation requirements. Uh, Mr. Tobias, or commonly known as Toby van Rooyen, van Rienen, apologies, uh, from the CSIR on ventilation guidance for COVID-19. And then my colleague in the building here, Mr. Moses McCorney from the Occupational Hygiene Section, uh, dealing with ventilation during COVID-19 pandemic from an occupational hygiene perspective. And clearly you can see that we need our colleagues back in some session sometime in the near future, hopefully dealing with updates, both on the new directions that is expected to be gazetted, as well as the, um, uh, might be a longer time for the new regulations on hazardous biological agents to be addressed, given that COVID-19 is a bug. Uh, a biological hazard that we've got to deal with in our workplaces. And then obviously to our panelists, uh, those who are in the background, 
who've been answering all of the questions in the background, and that's uh, including Ms. Jeanette Mangani, the head of occupational hygiene, her colleague, um, Gabriel Mizan, um, Karen Dupree, uh, Nkateko Makubele, um, and then again, finally, thanks to Dr. Tanusha Singh for having joined and opened this webinar for us, the head of our COVID-19 OHUD um, team here. And thank you very much for joining us on this webinar. We look forward to seeing on the next webinar. We will be shutting down in a minute or two once those questions are gone. Thank you and goodbye.